everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is Cinder 102, uh, pouring a solid foundation for block storage services. Uh, my name is Jeff Applewhite. I'm a uh, technical marketing engineer with NetApp, and uh, so glad you all could be here today. This is not the fiber channel session, contrary to what's on the board outside. So uh, good to see everybody. Um, so uh, I was kind of astounded when I saw the hands that went up uh, when they first, you know, they asked how many people are new at the summit, uh, and and just you know, hundreds of hands went up near me. So uh, when I saw that, I thought, well, it might be good to to kind of capture the new people that are here. And so, even though this is Cinder 102, I'm going to do a 101 recap for just for those of you who might be completely new to Cinder. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that, so I don't want to scare anybody away by covering 101. But just uh, just a brief kind of overview of that, and then we're going to move into the other things that are on the agenda. Still have plenty of time for all that. So, um, here we go, try that again, getting a lag here, sorry my slides are uh, lagging here. Still not happening for me. <laughs> I could turn my laptop around, but I don't think anybody could see it very well. <laughs> Can I get some uh, technical help? That's a popular slide. That's not the one I'm looking for, but. <laughs> okay. Let's see, does the HDMI have any? There we go, great, HDMI. All right, so uh, the agenda today is, as I said, I'm gonna do a brief sender orientation, talk about um, you know, the basics of, of block storage, what it is, and I'm also gonna talk a little about what it isn't, because honestly, when I came into OpenStack, it was a little bit confusing of what exactly is sender, what's included in sender and what is not sender, so I'll talk a little bit about that um, as far as you know, ephemeral storage and, and other terms that you'll hear around sender, um, talk about backup and store of volumes and also some new functionality in that respect that's uh, available now. Uh, talk uh, also about consistency groups, replicated volumes, some new administrative operations that are available within Cinder, and uh, some other new features as well. And then finally, I'm gonna do a, uh, and if you pay close attention to some of my examples, uh, we'll reference that, reference back to that when I get to the troubleshooting part. Uh, so, <laughs> The, uh, the, there'll be an error that you can, that we'll talk about later, but actually I'll, it's, it's fixed in the early slides because I, I figured I would just use whatever I hit when I'm doing my demo to, uh, to demonstrate here how to troubleshoot Cinder, so keep an eye out for that. So basically, Cinder 101, block storage basics. Uh, you know, so it's, it's the service within OpenStack. Uh, it's the equivalent of, uh, of Amazon's, you know, Elastic Blocks service. Um, basically, it is uh, the ability to create, extend, delete, block devices that get provided to virtual machines or instances in an OpenStack cloud. Very basic, uh, it's appropriate for any, you know, any scenario where you need block storage, whether it's a database, uh, whether it's a root disk for a VM, and I'll talk a little bit about when do you use Cinder for a root disk, when, when, when would you use what's called ephemeral storage for that uh, instead. 
Uh, also, snapshot uh, functionality is provided through Cinder, you know, point in time uh, capture of the state of the, of the disk at any one point in time through a snapshot. And they can be used to do the restores as well and create new volumes. Uh, and also, you know, there's interaction between Cinder and other services. And to me, that's where things really get interesting with Cinder. Cinder, you know, creating a, a block device in and of itself is not so snazzy, but when you start interacting with Glance and Nova and all the other services, that's where you start to get the real value of Cinder that's enabled. Uh, so just an overview. Um, so if you look at the way, you know, there's different processes that I'll be running in a Cinder deployment um, for every, and I'll get into a sort of a brief description of how the, the blocks of the configuration relate to a process, but basically for every backend you configure, you'll have a, a Cinder process that's listening on the backside. Uh, but at the front end, you have, you know, users that are making RESTful uh, API requests to the Cinder service. And so they're not actually generating REST uh, through, you know, like WGET or something like that. They're either doing it through the Cinder command line client, or they'd be going through Horizon, or there'll be some automated tool that's actually accessing those APIs and making RESTful calls uh, through to the Cinder API service. And the API, the API service's job basically is to stuff those requests that come in into the message bus, AMQP, and then there, you know, there's interaction with SQL at certain points to determine what services are available and, and different uh, metadata that get stored in the SQL database. But in general, the requests are going in the message bus, and if it's a backup job, sender backup takes off. But uh, in most cases, the sender scheduler is going to come by, pull those requests off, and it's going to do the filter scheduler is going to decide where does this, this block device need to get created. So when we get to talking about uh, troubleshooting, it's good to keep in mind that even though your sender volume backends are actually you know, providing the, the block storage service, it's the scheduler where you're likely to see things go awry or things that happen that are unexpected that you might have expected one thing to happen but something else happened. So looking at the sender scheduler is where, typically where you're going to go. And we'll talk about that. So this is where, where I talk about what Cinder is not. Uh, Cinder is the block service, whereas Manila, which is another project that's in incubation uh, within OpenStack, is the file service. So whereas uh, blocks are provisioned through a hypervisor up through to the VM, provided as a block device. A block device just shows up in the virtual machine. You know, it might be dev VDB, uh, just appears in the virtual machine. I can format that device. I can you know, put a file system on it, mount it up. Uh, provision services through it, and then snapshot it, do all those kinds of things. Um, Manila, the, the point of that is to actually enable uh, file sharing, you know, whether it's NFS or SIFS or, you know, a GlusterFS or GPFS, various different uh, file protocols within an OpenStack tenant namespace or network uh, namespace. So Manila is emerging, you know, it's not actually a formal project yet. It's very close within the Liberty time frame. That'll be available as well. But just wanted to kind of draw that distinction. So whether you need block services or file services, there's two different uh, ways you can go with an OpenStack. And then so another th term you'll hear that uh, is not really Cinder, but you'll hear the term ephemeral disk. What does ephemeral disk mean? So if you think of a hypervisor, and it's really just a, a Linux machine, bare metal machine running uh, KVM, Quimu, or, or, you know, it could be ESX, it could be other hypervisors on the market. Um, essentially, it's a disk that is designed to, as a, as a bubble would indicate, is going to be around for, the, you know, for a while, but it, it, when that VM has performed its function, is shut down and terminated, that disk goes away. And it may just be sitting on local storage on the server. Um, it could be mounted in cases where you want to do live migration, you know, you have to have uh, you know, typically with KVM, you know, like varlib, Nova instances will be mounted and shared, and then you can migrate a VM from one hypervisor to the other. Uh, so in that case, even though it's technically ephemeral, it's, it's a shared uh, disk. So. Uh, you would use it in cases uh, where, for instance, uh, in, in our OpenStack team at NetApp, we use ephemeral disks. We've had, you know, tens of thousands of ephemeral VMs come up and go down in our continuous integration environment where we're testing our OpenStack, uh, and our OpenStack code and things like that. Well, you know, VM will come up, it'll run a job, those jobs get logged into, you know, put into Logstash or something, and then that VM's performed its service, it goes away, the disk is deleted, no need to keep it around. So that's where ephemeral would come into play. And I gotta 
basic, so this is sort of the Cinder 101. Uh, I wanted to play this because this is the kind of thing that I do anytime we bring on new people on the team. Uh, it just sort of light bulbs go off when you see something happening. You can actually see a volume name getting entered in. Uh, the type of, uh, you know, if I had multiple types of storage on the back end, I could select that and then create a volume. Uh, it's very simple stuff. It's just, uh, to me, it's just endlessly fascinating. I don't know why. <laughs> even, even the basic stuff, when you really break it down, it's actually pretty complex. So this is a case where we're booting up a, uh, a Nova instance. I select the flavor, which is a, basically the memory and the disk. I select a, an image. I launch it. And so that's ephemeral. It's booting up. That, that instance is booting from a glance image. Um, it's coming up. Memory is spawning. The IP address is available. And then here, this, this video is kind of rolling along pretty fast. But what I'm doing now is attaching the DB volume that I created to the, to the instance. So that disk is now going to magically appear within that VM as probably dev VDB or dev VDC or, or something of that sort. Then you can provision it. You can create a file system on it, use it within your VM. Um, another uh, mode that you can do is you can create it from a base. You can create a sender uh, volume from a base image in Glance. So basically what's happening is creates a blank volume, pulls the Glance image, that gets copied into the sender volume, and then you can boot, and you can even make that bootable. So you can boot up a sender volume that is not ephemeral. It'd be persistent in whatever your block storage is on the back end, and, uh, and use that without, uh, without fear that it would disappear. So now that was 101. Now 102, we're starting to get into the command line. What I used to call, <laughs> we used to call it the dark place. All this is a white terminal. You know, you're actually doing things on the command line here. And so whether you're, whether you're doing sender commands here or you're hop operating through Horizon, you're creating those RESTful calls to the sender API service that's uh, putting them in the queue, the scheduler's taking them off, uh, handling that request however is appropriate, whether it's a snapshot create or delete, uh, et cetera. So in this case, I'm just I'm, you know, showing that you can extend the volume. Uh, the, from image is the volume name. I grew the size from 25 to 30. It shows that it's extending. And then it's available. So that, that block device grew you know, from 25 to 30. Then you'd obviously have to extend your file systems or whatever operation you'd need to do to utilize it. And that's about it. So now that you've passed 101, your kung fu is strong. <laughs> You're ready. <laughs> You're ready for the real world now. All right, let's get into this a little bit more, a little bit heavier stuff. That's kind of a basic recap of what you can do with Cinder. And you can see even the base functionality is very, very powerful if you think about um, OpenStack as a way to wrap an API around multiple hardware vendors, whether it's NetApp or EMC or SolidFire or you're running Ceph or whatever you're running, you know, LVMI, SCSI in the back end. There's lots of choices. They all plug into this common API. You can write code, and that code will work anywhere, no matter what the back end is. A very powerful, you know, basic concept. So, so uh, the backup and restore. Um, basically, you know, it's, it's what, it, you, what you would think. It's a command line interface to create backups of a volume. Um, and so it's a little bit, uh, to me, it was not very intuitive at first, but the backups in, in the fault case go to Swift. So they'll go to your object store. Um, that, that block device gets copied into, made into chunks, stuffed into Swift. Swift is whatever the replication is in Swift, takes care of moving those blocks around to create the data protection that you need. Um, and you know, so basically on the command line client, you would do sender backup create and give it the volume ID, you know, the GUID or the ID of the, the volume or the name. Um, the reverse process would be sender backup restore from that. And then it'd pull from Swift, restore that sender volume to the state that it was in prior to any data changes. One thing that's new in, uh, in just, just recently, there's an option to back up to NFS instead of Swift. So if you want to, you made just a two line change to your center conf, you can enable that NFS backup driver, you can back up to an NFS device. So uh, that's, a, that's a good option for people that might want to use that for replicating data around, or you know, there's a lot of different use cases around that. So Swift is not the only target. And here I'm just kind of going to illustrate a, a simple uh, listing of a volume. 
um, creating a backup from it, if I could type. And then I, I kind of want to just show you how things actually appear when you, uh, once you have a live backup. And then here, uh, at the Swift level, where things actually get stored. So I'm doing there a list. Uh, I see that there's a volume backups container. Then I do a list on the volume backups. And look, there's all the files that got broken up from that single one gig sender volume. If I then uh, remove that backup, delete it, and do a list again, well, it's confirmed the backup is gone, and then Swift, uh, Swift list on the volume backups. You'll see there's no objects there. So basic, uh, basic illustration of how, how, that back, how that works. <clears throat> Uh, within the Kilo time frame, there's, uh, there's also support for a new, uh, there was a blueprint that was partially implemented, um, and incremental uh, backups are now an option. So you can do a sender backup create dash INCR and give it the, the full backup container that already exists, and it'll do a, an incremental backup from that point in time. Um, there were also options to, there were there's some other advanced options in that, that blueprint that didn't, didn't make it in, but, uh, and this is, and as I said, uh, if you want to do an NFS backup, you can set your backup driver sender.backup.drivers.nfs, and then your backup share to any, any NFS share that you want to backup your files to as well. Restart your sender processes, and that would be your target at that point. Okay. Uh, another valuable thing is uh, support for encrypted volumes. Um, that, that was a tricky thing, and you know, the Juno release brought the capability to encrypt a volume, but there was no way to back it up. So uh, not, not very useful. So now in Kilo, uh, there is support for you know, uh, backup and store of encrypted volumes. Um, as, if you know anything about encryption, you know you have to have a key to do encryption and decryption. So basically what happens is the, uh, the UUID uh, key gets copied through the key manager um, and allows the source volume to be deleted, and it's encryption key. UUID made invalid. So basically, you could create um, the backup, it would be encrypted, you could delete your source volume, and yet the key will go with it that uh, um, corresponds to the backup. So you could then restore if you need to. Uh, one thing important to keep in mind is that restores must be made to the same volume type as a source. So if you had a, an old backup and you deleted the volume type and you needed to restore it, you're out of luck. So just something to keep in mind if you're an operator. In that case, the backup rest restoration would fail. All right, uh, consistency groups. Um, this is a relatively new feature. Uh, there's very sparse support within the center. If you go and look at the center matrix, there's not very many drivers that support consistency groups. Um, basically, it's a set of center volumes that are grouped together, and you would use them as a kind of a logical set, mainly for the purpose of creating snapshots, so where you have an application that has dependencies on, uh, let's say, a database with log volumes and various different pieces of it uh, spread around. You might want to create a consistency group for those those volumes so you can treat them as a set uh, for uh, for you know archival or storage, whatever. Um, it can support more than one volume type. So if you have uh, you know a consistency group with you know part of it's in, in, a, in a volume type that's flash based, part of it's in a, you know spinning media, whatever, you can still create a, a consistency group around that. And uh, I'll show you, that you can see the reference here if you're interested in that feature. Uh, example usage here, center consist group create, you give it the name of the consistency group and the, the volume type. You always have to special, specify the volume type. Um, and so you basically create a volume and add it to the consistency group at the time you're doing it. Um, so that uh, you know the, the system, you have to have a consistency group ID uh, to do that. Um, and there's some examples here. I'm not going to deep dive into that. It's as I said, it's it is kind of sparsely supported. These things are moving. There's uh, active discussions on a lot of this stuff in the Cinder community. And if there's anybody here, and we'll get to the QA session, if there's people on core team that have comments or thoughts here. Well, feel free to chime in. Uh, replicated volumes. This is. Um, 
basically this is a key storage feature for you know, high availability, disaster recovery type scenarios for, uh, for applications in OpenStack. Um, there's an existing V1 implementation of this. Um, it's sort of a first take um, go at it. Basically, they said, well, let's get something done. We'll get it out there and, and uh, you know, to try, to try to make some progress in this. So basically, you know, the driver would establish a replicated relationship for you. Um, you know, it's create the primary to secondary uh, relationship uh, and then be able to promote the secondary uh, in the case of, a, you know, a, a switch over. Uh, and then make that primary and then re-enable replication in the reverse direction. Um, it's, it's, it's been a tricky process though because, you know, in Cinder there's a lot of different hardware vendors, they have a lot of different uh, technologies, different ways to implement things on the back end, so finding a common, you know, uh, approach that really makes everybody happy is, is a challenge. So, um, what, you know, people have done different things with NetApp, we've done things with our store service catalog where we have replicated volumes that pre-exist and you just simply filter on those by having a, you know, uh, an extra spec that says I want a mirrored volume. Uh, others want to create the, the relationship anew as, as something's, you know, happening in real time. So there's different ways to, to solve for it. So basically if you see that the, the volume type has the capabilities replication true, uh, Cinder can perform, you know, a variety of operations on those uh, create, update, extend, deletes. Um, you know, as I said, it'd be basically setting up the relationship, being uh, promoting the secondary, falling back. Uh, and so the, the different things, you know, the uh, actions will depend on what the operation is. Um, also, V2 is, uh, the ver you know, the next version of this is, is an active discussion now in, in, uh, in the Cinder uh, dev team. So. Uh, if you guys have thoughts, uh, needs about that, specific use cases, it'd be good to bring that up now um, in the developer community. So I want to shift a little bit and talk a little bit about resource pool management and sort of describe how that works. Um, uh, in the Juno release of OpenStack, Cinder uh, introduced this concept of storage pools. And prior to that, every back end was basically this one monolithic you know, group of storage that didn't really have any distinguishing characteristics of, uh, amongst it. So, but now there's a concept of storage pool. So you can have a storage pool that has, you know, uh, various different volumes in it that have different, and this is an example based on NetApp, NetApp capabilities, but these could be, um, they can be very vendor specific, you know, whatever the vendor can enable um, through those extra specs can be, you know, treated as, as different pools within that back end. So basically the way it works is the, you know, uh, the driver comes up, it's, it tells the scheduler, hey, I have three storage pools. You know, they have capacities of X, Y, and Z. Um, and they are, you know, these attributes, these various uh, attributes that are specific to these pools. And then the sender scheduler says, okay, I've got that. You know, I'll make provisioning uh, decisions based on that information. Um, so the driver kind of informs the scheduler um, what it's capable of. And then the, the scheduler's job is to do the filtering and, and make the decisions based on that. So if you think about it, I mean, you know, a storage array can, as I said, you know, uh, can be subdivided in lots of pools. Uh, within, you know, within our context, we might have, uh, you know, a volume that has mirroring enabled. We might have a volume that has QoS enabled. We might have compressed volume or deduplicated volume or, you know, a volume that's based on flash media or spinning disk, SATA, you know, SAS, what have you. Um, and so those can be put in different, you know, different pools within that back end. Uh, and we can do, do things with extra specs to allow the sender scheduler to make intelligent decisions on that. And I'll get into actually some pretty cool uh, capabilities that have just come out recently with that regard. Um, in this example, you know, we're, we're representing different media on the, on the back end of, of this storage device. So uh, volume migration. This is, a, when I say administrative operation, this means you need to be, obviously, you need to be an admin user. So this is something that would be available to the cloud operator, would not be available to a standard tenant in the public cloud or private cloud. Um, you'd have to have special permissions to do this. Um, basically what it is, is a transparent move of data, as you would imagine, from the current backend uh, to another target backend. That can be uh, I'm going to uh, show you an example in a minute. It's actually a pool-to-pool -pool migration. You can do it within actually entire drivers. I could migrate from 
you know, let's say I wanted to migrate from an NFS store to an iSCSI store or, or what have you, you can you actually migrate between drivers as well as pools. The only problem is there is one gotcha you cannot have existing snapshots. So you can do things like doing a workaround where you, you know, create a volume from a snapshot and then migrate that volume uh, is, is kind of a workaround, but um, that's one of the limitations right now. Uh, also, migration of volumes attached to Nova instances is only supported uh, where the, the hypervisor runs, live, you know, is capable of live migration. Uh, and the, it gives you a little brief example of the command line uh, to do that. Here you're specifying basically the, it's kind of the host name, but you would get this information here from a sender services list command. It'll show you all of your, all of your drivers. I'll get the questions in just a bit. <laughs> Sorry? It's very urgent because this is, very, this is a little bit confusing. This need, be, need to be updated from the doc documentation. I'm sure if you work this command in the library, it will fail for sure because you need to add the pool. Okay. We'll go into the example here. i do do an example in a bit. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just picking a sender volume, I'm gonna show it, and I'm gonna grep for just the, uh, the host field. So basically, where does it reside? I'm trying to find out where this volume is, and I'm gonna migrate it from its current location to a different location. In this case, I've got two back-end uh, locations, vol sender one, or vol sender and vol sender two. Uh, I'm telling the driver to migrate from sender to sender two. Um, basically, it's doing the block move on the back end transparently, um, and then see how it's progressing. Actually, I may have waited for it to actually complete here. So yes, it, uh, you can see that it's now, instead of where it began out on ball sender, it's now sitting in ball sender too. So it's a nice feature for the administrator if you need to do migrations due to load or, or things of that sort. All right. Moving on to sender manage. Um, this is a, it, <laughs> I had a discussion with the guys on our team. To me, I think of it as an import export. Manage also makes sense too. It's kind of just a semantics thing. Uh, it's a way to uh, take pre existing LUNs or files that you want to bring into sender uh, and, and bring them in through the manage command. Um, it, has, it basically takes two options. You can either do it from the source name uh, here or the source ID. Uh, it's very vendor specific. Um, if you give it the source ID, it may mean, uh, you know, it means a pretty generic thing, but uh, it's up to your driver to figure that out. Uh, this, you know, the source name in this case is obviously a, a file path or a LUN path to ball, ball one, LUN one, uh, and giving it the, the pool. Also, talk a little bit about, in, in order to have this kind of features, you need to have what we call multi backend. You know, if you want to move things around within your sender configuration file, you're going to have uh, the enabled backends parameter. And so these, these blocks refer to uh, this config here, where the standard LVM iSCSI driver, or uh, in this case, the C dot, which is really just a reference to that identifier there. And you have, you know, your, your drivers all have their own particular uh, configuration parameters. Uh, depending on the vendor and the, uh, what's required to, to make that particular driver work. And then when you, uh, you know, you'll see that uh, you can use these types. Go ahead. Yeah. And here I'm becoming the admin user again rather than doing dash dash OS username, which is kind of tedious on the command line. So what I'm doing here is to create a sender type. Uh, create a sender type named C dot. Um, I'm also going to create a, a key value on the C dot type, and I'm going to set volume back in um, name. to C dot NFS. And then just show you that as a uh, the extra specs list here. So what this shows you is that the, you know, the LVM driver was pre-created, it already existed, and then I just created a, a, volume, a, a type of C dot with the value of C dot NFS. Um, we'll use that in just a bit. 
So another thing that's uh, fairly new, uh, there's been some optimizations of the scheduler. Uh, the scheduler now supports um, oversubscription for thin provisioning of SAN. Um, if you think about it, uh, in a thin provisioning case, the provision capacity parameter might not actually mean a whole lot to you. So basically what you have now is a way to over-provision through the max oversubscription ratio, and that defaults to one, which is a safe setting, but if you want to bump that up and oversubscribe to 1.5 or two or whatever, whatever you decide as a cloud administrator, um, that, that option is now there. Um, another very cool feature is that you can actually do pretty advanced filtering uh, with these filter functions now. Um, so if, you know, I'll get into an example in a bit here where I show what the driver actually, you know, reports to the, to the sender scheduler. You can basically take um, those different parameters that are reported to the scheduler and do advanced math or regular expressions to say if, you know, stats.invols is less than 1,000 and volume size is less than five, then deploy it, you know, here. Um, so you can get very fine grain with the way uh, you, you do that. So there's a goodness function and then this, this filter function. There's more, if you want to dig into that feature, there's more here uh, at the bottom here. But this could be a very powerful way to kind of do some intelligent uh, provisioning within uh, Center. I mean, the scheduler does a good job of figuring out, you know, basically what, what back end do I have that has the most space and, and putting the volume there. But in some cases, that, that's not enough. So you've got a little more power here uh, through this new feature. Basically what I just said, uh, basically, you know, uh, the free capacity uh, in a thin provisioning profile, uh, scenario doesn't really mean a whole lot, so. Okay, another big thing that uh, was a big thing for the Cinder project uh, this time around was the ability to do rolling upgrades. That's been a, uh, an ongoing pain point, and not just in the Cinder project. That has been a, a painful part of running OpenStack in general. Um, and so with this release, a lot of the projects are on board now with being able to do rolling upgrades where, you know, basically masking the complexity of schema changes and databases and things of that sort. Um, it's all handled uh, much more dynamically. Um, it, this particular change came from code in the Nova project um, that was modified to allow services to be independent of schema upgrades from this point forward. Um, so operators, you know, if you're, if you're one of these operators, I'm sure you know about this and you're, you're very happy to to, to have it uh, in your tool set. Okay, another thing uh, that's, that's kind of a new thing within Cinder is uh, what is referred to as private volumes. Um, there's basically, uh, you know, um, and it is public flag. It's very similar to the Nova construct of is public. Uh, so you can set a, a, a type to be false, uh, public is false. So only, only the administrator can see it. If that's what you, all you do, you set it to false then you as the administrator can see this type, nobody else can see it. So it's good for testing scenarios where you wanna validate that your config is good and that provisioning is working well. Um, so, uh, but if you wanted to add a tenant to it, uh, to that type, then only that tenant would have access to it. So let's say, you know, you might, uh, might use that where you had um, a high value analytics project, you know, you need to grant a certain tenant or a group of users uh, access to that particular storage, you could do it through the private volumes. Uh, construct. Okay, so if, you, <laughs> if your Kung Fu is weak, <laughs> you need to do some troubleshooting. Um, the first thing, if you're running a, a, um, a distribution of OpenStack that's, you know, vendor supported, most of them will all um, disable the verbose and the, uh, the, the debug uh, in the logging. So the first step is to turn that stuff on. You need verbose, you need debug. Because if there's trace, trace errors or debug logs that you need to get access, those will be completely hidden for you until you do this and restart your center services. So that's step one. Uh, you also need to have an understanding of which log is going to have your error. As I said, you know, the scheduler is the one that's making the decisions. If the scheduler is aware of all the different sender backends that might be distributed across multiple hosts or different arrays, uh, it'll know where the capacity is and make decisions based on that. So you can see that... Um, you know, here, you need to make sure that your services are up as a first step. That's obvious troubleshooting. Uh, and also, you need to figure out where your, your center volume resides. You can do that with that uh, uh, admin show command. 
Okay, let's say you have two volume types, one C dot, one LVM1. Uh, I create an extra, extra spec of C dot NFS. I try to do a create, and it looks all good, right? But then you get the dreaded no valid host. <laughs> this is my personal P with a, this is a very common message that you see in the, in the scheduler logs. You'll typically get, and you'll get it in Nova, you'll get it in sender, no valid host. And it's, it is exactly what it says, but unfortunately it doesn't tell you what the next step is. So you gotta dig a little further to figure out well, what does no valid host mean? So in this case, um, <laughs> let me flip forward here. So I'm looking at uh, what my backend driver is reporting, volume backend name C mode NFS. Does it match? No, the problem was I had C dot NFS in my volume type that what I created earlier. Okay, so if you have a mismatch between what the, the driver is reporting, this would come from your sender configuration block here. So you can't just create extra specs and, and hope that they're gonna work. If they don't match what the driver's actually reporting, you're gonna have a mismatch and things are gonna fall apart very quickly. So the fix would be either to change your configuration to your volume backend name would be c.nfs, or you could update your volume backend name equal cmodif nfs here with your extra specs. And that, this, the reason I wanted to bring this out, this is kind of applies broadly. It's not just with volume backend names. Uh, as I said, if you have mismatch between what the, what the sender dri uh, driver's reporting and what the scheduler uh, knows about through extra specs, um, it's gonna be a problem. So that's, that's all I actually have. I think we have a little bit of time for questions if anybody wants to dig in. Um, we have a lot of documentation here if you guys are interested in that. Um, so if, you, if anybody has questions, please come to the microphone. Nineteen. Uh, are the notes available? Yes, this will be a, this will be available online, and they're recording this as well. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, can you go to nineteen, please? We want to review the uh, so the, the example that I, the demo that I showed you to migrate was the correct syntax. I'm not sure what you're wanting yeah, to look I at know. here. Uh, yeah, you see, some, um, I think in the very the last line you have to add a pound sign plus the pool's name. Otherwise, the command won't work. Oh, you're talking about the pool? Yeah. Yeah, I pulled this from the docs online, and you're, you're correct. Oh, the doc need to be updated definitely. Otherwise, yeah. it caused a lot of confusion. Yeah, that was that was from docs uh, online. Just that's one point. Yeah, that, I think my example had uh, the pool, but yeah, the, I uh, know. So that's why I, I pointed that point out. And the other thing, gentlemen, I think is. Uh, um, this command only works for uh, migrating between, I think within the same backend. If we want to migrate, for example, from LVM to, to NetApp, for example, we have to use the command retype. So this is a, this is a great confusion uh, caused by one migration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, those extra specs that you set on Cinder volume, um, let's say you set something wrong you know, because it's all textual. Uh, you want to change it, right? So question number one, can you change it on the fly? Yes. Um, let's see if I can get to that slide real quick. Uh, basically, when I do the uh, type set command, uh, it's essentially an update. It looks, I think it's this slide here. So this command here, you can run this command 100 times with 100 different values here, and it'll just update, update, update every time, okay? If it's, so that parameter will just get updated. Does that make sense? Do you have to restart Cinder services? No. no. Okay. No, that's dynamic, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Else? <clears throat> I have a question about the replicated volumes. Yes. Um, so basically, um, I would like to understand more how you would make it work with two different data centers. Do you mean that, um, for example, in one zone, you have one Cinder backend, in the other zone, you have another Cinder backend, and then you can do it automatically, or you will have need one backend across two data centers? That yeah, <laughs> that, that gets to be very vendor specific. I mean, NetApp has a way we've solved that, but the replicated volumes is, uh, you know, I would advise you to go look at the Cinder matrix and look at the drivers that actually support replicated volumes. We can filter on volumes that are replicated, so you can set those relationships up, and data automatically gets, you know, transferred to the remote volume. We can filter on that through an extra spec. There's just different approaches of trying, trying to enable this kind of functionality. So, yeah, go out and look at the, the matrix for the Cinder drivers and you'll see, yeah. Can Cinder do placement of volumes based on I.O.? 
based on I.O. Uh, I believe, uh, is there anybody from Center Core here? I believe that is one of the features that gets uh, reported up through uh, the, the driver and the scheduler. Anybody here know for sure? I.O.? Don't have anybody from Core here? I think so. We'd have to take that offline then. All right. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Uh, there's a question about the private volumes. Oh, I'm sorry? Uh, question about the private volumes. Private volumes? Yeah, so is it possible to assign a volume type to multiple projects or it's a single project assignment? Yes. Okay. I believe you can assign multiple tenants to the private volume, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks.